If you're a Harry Potter fan, well, you've had a heck of a week. The reboot is on the way. And that little reboot that I was talking about months ago has come to fruition. Rejoice, Harry Potter fans, rejoice! But if you're a Star Wars fan, that prediction I made about Rey returning, about the Acolyte being real, all of that is true, and it may be worse than we had even considered. Kathleen Kennedy, on the way out, is making everybody shout she is turning the Force is female into a real franchise reality. We're going to examine all of this and why exactly Lucasfilm is so bent on making sure that Rey replaces Luke Skywalker. Not only that, but they're determined to push the sequel trilogy and the High Republic, two parts of the franchise which are the least exciting to the market. Explaining entertainment, keeping you ahead of the culture curve, it's what we attempt to do each and every day here on the WDW Pro channel. If you like stuff like that, well, you might want to click that like button, share, subscribe, and you can stick it to the algorithms. When you click it, we're talking about that notification bell. Joining us today to talk about Star Wars is the one and only, the Star Wars Encyclopedia Incarnate, Lauren Connor. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for having me. All right, Lauren. We have seen quite a bit of Star Wars news. We have seen people taking that Star Wars news in all kinds of directions. But uh, we think that, without a doubt, Kathleen Kennedy did not retire at uh, Star Wars Celebration. There were no Viking funerals for her. And uh, there were no huge uh, doses of uh, panels all celebrating her legacy. Instead, she seems to be squarely there for the moment. Now, that lines up with what I've been saying for a while, which is that uh, Kathleen Kennedy is likely to exit either late this year or next year. And I have some reasons for thinking that, and I've been saying that for three years now. But Kathleen Kennedy uh, has had this forces female idea for a while now, and it seems to me that she is fully committed to pursuing, uh, making sure that she eradicates the stories of Luke Skywalker and what he achieved in all of those original stories and swapping that over to the character of Rey. Uh, we've got an article out of Yahoo Entertainment that I want to read and I want to get your take on uh, what, what's going on here and uh, how this may be Kennedy's last ditch effort to move Star Wars very far into this uh, female centric franchise. Before we read the article though, Lauren, what did you think of Star Wars Celebration in particular? And uh, were you expecting perhaps to see Kathleen Kennedy exited or were you not surprised at all that she is still there and still apparently in the driver's seat? Well, I, I think I'm surprised that she appeared at Star Wars Celebration. I was not completely buying into the idea that they were going to have this retirement announcement. Uh, on the other hand, I did think that maybe they would start prepping the decks for that. My belief up until this point was that they were going to wait for Indy 5 to come out, give it, say, a month, and then I figured they would be making their announcements. But the fact that the uh, uh, that she was on stage, even though it was briefly, the fact that she was as present as she was, and more importantly, the slate that they announced that they were going to put out, that all quite shocked me and makes me think that perhaps she is more entrenched than than I th not only than I thought than maybe even anybody thought. Uh, I'm now I, I'm not sure I'm convinced she's leaving. Period. Um, but I think if that's the case, it may be because I'm not sure who would want the job at this point. Uh, the rumor okay, has been you you bring up a heck of a point. Go ahead, Lauren. That that's a big one. I think it was a doomcock rumor, uh, the quote that she made that, that said that uh, I will either have my way or I will burn this nonsense to the ground. I don't know <laughs> if that quote was ever authenticated. I don't know if we have any corroboration that she ever actually said that, but it certainly feels like it's true. And unfortunately, I'm at a point where I figured that we could outlast this. Eventually, there was going to be a point when the financial bite was going to hit Disney and they would be forced to course correct. They continue to double. Uh, economic ruin problems. would smoke her out of there. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I figured it would have you, to happen. At you were point. wrong, Lord. There's no <laughs> bottom to this. <laughs> There's they, no void. 
<laughs> they have done such damage now, especially if they continue on on this path, that even if they tried to course correct after this point, I don't know that anybody cares. They may, I think they fatally, just, I, I think they've destroyed the foundation. And if that's the case, it's done, folks. I'm sorry. Well, the foundation was Luke and Darth Vader, right? Anakin. Yes. And that seems to be what they're after. So uh, let's have at it. But uh, yeah, so I, I think that you're exactly right. There is a significant catch-22 in trying to get rid of Kathleen Kennedy. There always has been, but it continues to get worse and worse. And here's why. Let's say that you want to remove Kathleen Kennedy and put in a new studio head. And I think that if Indiana Jones 5 does very poorly, then you know all bets are off in terms of how long she can stay. But uh, even if you want to replace her, she has turned that place into such a toxic hellhole that who in their right mind would want to take it? So, you know, then what do you do? What do you do? How do you bring in somebody to lead a place that is uh, a vile and toxic uh, just cesspool, right? It's a, it's a septic tank of, of rot at Lucasfilm. Make sure to catch The Pro Show Thursdays, 5 to 7 Eastern Time. Entertainment Explained, The Culture Curve Conquered, live with Pro and all his friends. Yeah, and, and the people that are filling key slots there, I mean, it's not just the producers that do this stuff. You have visual effects people, you have sound people, and I'm not saying that they're all agenda-driven. I'm sure many of them are just workaday people who come in and do their jobs, and, and they sure. go home at night, and they're not really ideological in that sense. But you tend to have loyalty to the people that you work with. And if there was a mass exodus of people or if there was a significant layoffs that occurred within the company, that affects morale. And some of these skills are key skills to keep a department running. And Lucasfilm for decades now has been the cream of the crop when it comes to visual effects. Uh, it's one of the reasons that Disney wanted to purchase Lucasfilm in the first place. It wasn't just Star Wars. It was that... ILM does the visual effects for many other movies. So they can absolutely they have that effects house in house. It helps them with all of their other franchises, but they can also contract out to other studios and make profit off of their movies. So um I think they have to be a little worried about guys like Hal Hickel. Uh if he decided that he doesn't like a new direction, if that's the way they wanted to go. I'm not saying that he's a keystone person, but if you lose enough of those kind of people. ILM is no longer the the powerhouse that it once was. It's a great point, Lauren. Let's uh, let's dive into the Yahoo Entertainment article we have up here. This by Kim Taylor Foster. Expect more female driven Star Wars stories, says Lucasfilm's Kathleen Kennedy. There's a balance in the force. Well, we've had a lot, so I guess we still have to keep balancing. Maybe we're trying to balance against the uh, against all of the legacy series and cartoons and stories that existed. I'm not even sure how that would how we would still have to be balancing, but hey, maybe that's what we got to do. The studio boss explains why it's thrilling to put women front and center in the franchise. Lucasfilm boss Kathleen Kennedy says that Ahsoka, the Acolyte, and Daisy Ridley's just announced Star Wars movie directed by Charmaine Obeid Chinoy signal that more women-led projects set in that galaxy far, far away are on the horizon. I would say definitely the studio president tells Yahoo Entertainment at Star Wars Celebration 2023. We don't set out to say, okay, this is going to be a project led by women. It evolves that way, Kennedy continues. Let me stop there and say, no, that's not correct because there was a time back with the Lucasfilm story group back around the time of The Last Jedi when it was declared that it was going to be just women and it was only women in the story group. And we see how that went. It turns out that uh, when you are non-diverse, that you get a monolithic and often poor product. So... And she says, and I'm, ple I'm pleasantly surprised to see there's a balance in the force, let's put it that way, because in everything that we've been doing, I think we've attracted some really strong women, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, and that's been thrilling, although if they're too strong, we will get rid of them and humiliate them. That's my own addition there. The Ahsoka series, which is set to premiere on Disney Plus in August this year, stars Ros Rosario Dawson uh, as the titular force-sensitive ex-Jedi Padawan and brings her together with Mary Elizabeth Winstead's Hera Syndulla and Natasha Liu Bordiso's Sabine Wren, all three are characters first appeared in the various Star Wars animated series overseen by the Mandalorian co-creator Dave Filoni. 
Here, they're teaming up to thwart the return of fan favorite villain, Grand Admiral Thrawn, who is also making his live action debut. Now, uh, that is played by Mr. Mickelson coming in. Uh, the, he's also the voice actor. And my understanding is that casting was completed about 14 to 15 months ago. So if you're going to give Lucasfilm credit for anything, you have to say that they at least did a good job of keeping uh, that cast, uh, that casting decision quiet, although many people speculated it. And we've known now, I've been talking about this for about three years, that Thrawn was going to be the big baddie of the Mandoverse. But uh, yeah, keeping that secret for 14 or 15 months was uh, quite impressive for Lucasfilm. Another prominent female character jumping from one Star Wars series to another is Andor's Mon Mothma. He was going to talk about that in Ahsoka. Um, and w w let me just pause there. Lauren, any thoughts on what we've read so far? Well, kind of echoing what you said before, it's amazing how a project can evolve that way when you have 80% of that story group that's female. Uh, I think she said that initially there were a couple of men that were in there, but it does seem that that's going to weight things a little bit. Speaking of weight and balancing, it seems to me that maybe the one feature of the force that hasn't been discussed in the movies is that apparently it's wobbly. I, I think it just kind of spins and, 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 and goes like this all the time. So maybe... Maybe we ought to abandon this whole balancing thing because it doesn't seem to be working out. Absolutely. All right, let's continue right along. Um, it, it goes through some of this stuff. Well, let's read this from, from Filoni. The important thing is that they're relatable to everyone, Filoni continues. I think I expect every kind of kid to relate to Sabine and what she's going through, what she's struggling with, and what she needs to overcome. The same that I watched kids being inspired by Luke. And that quote to me is dumb, Lorne because Luke is archetypal and Sabine is not. But we'll continue. I'm That's going to disagree. I, I'm okay. going disagree, to disagree please. there. Disagree, um, please. One of my favorite story arcs in the Rebel storyline was actually Sabine's, which surprised me because I was not a fan of her character right up until the point she came into possession of the Darksaber. And she had a story arc with Kanan Jarrus where he was talking to her about the history of it and learning to master her emotions and be in balance herself so that she could wield it effectively. And that was a story arc that very nearly brought me to tears. I thought that that was one of the best arcs that they had in that entire series. And it was all because of the way they told that story, the way that they made uh, Sabine's pain at, at her part in uh, helping the empire to oppress her people and how the loss of her family and all of that affected her. That's kind of the orphan story that Luke has. And I think that there is a parallel there that Dave actually handled very well. Okay. Well, I'll grant that then. Um, I guess where I'm coming from is just looking at the societal impact of the two characters and seeing uh, <laughs> the, the gravity of how Luke inspired an entire, well, maybe two Shh. generations. So that's, yeah. that's where I'm coming from on that. Definitely true in that respect. Sure. Sure. All right, so he says, if that inspires people that maybe would have said it's not for me or I can't do that, and now they say I can be that and I can do that, that's even better. You want it not. You want it to be not a time of change, but a time of inclusion. Uh, naturally, we ask the cast which Star Wars women they want back in the live action fold, whether an existing series or a project. For her part, Dawson picked the Martez sisters, Trace and Rafa, from the animated Clone <laughs> War series. What you got there? Um. I, I, no comment. I'm not, I'm not even going to dignify that with a with a response. <laughs> um, great. Let let's see. I'm sure. Why not? <laughs> All right. So we've got Ahsoka coming out August 2023, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that the Acolyte is coming out in 2024. We have recently seen that it was actually extended. Uh, they, they filed for an extension on production and on payments with, uh, the government over there in the United Kingdom. And so that is, that is seemingly going forward. And then we have the Ray movie, which appears to have been, uh, initiated from the top at Disney. Robert Iger came in and then within weeks we had Daisy Ridley reappearing at Lucasfilm. Then we had the, uh, leak that I picked up and ran with. And now she's been over there on the stage at Star Wars Celebration. She is the big headliner um, for all of Star Wars Celebration. That was the big, big news. She is now, and, and you know, there's this picture going around of her pregnant. We won't touch that in this, this video. But um, she's now the one who's going to restore the 
Jedi Order, restore the temple, et cetera, et cetera. What do you make, Lorne, of this idea that the offspring, the child of Palpatine, has somehow become the ultimate hero, uh, somehow both the chosen one and the redeemer, that's, the, uh, that's Anakin and Luke all in one, and w- I don't understand now what all of Star Wars was leading up to Rey. I don't know why. All of that seems superfluous now. It's just Rey, in my opinion. I don't know why Anakin or Luke are very important to the story. Well, okay. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here, and I'm going to try and be as non-snarky as I can. Uh, let, let's say that I'm giving this. All right, all right. The- Lauren, while you, okay, so you're going to de-snarkify. Right. Everybody knows, everybody knows that you've got to get a good uh, shoulder shrug going. Okay, let's get some shoulder shrugs in. Come on. Let's get some neck waggle. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay. He's yeah. de-snarkified. Loosened up. Um, I'm going to give Disney the greatest benefit of the doubt here. And let's say that they're you trying to approach. Kind. Well, I'm trying to be objective. <laughs> Let, let's say, and I think in this case, this is actually true. They know they have a mess on their hands. They, they can't not know that they have a mess on their hands. The thing that they needed to do in the first place was restore the Jedi Order. That, that was almost essential. And the reason why that was so important is because what you could have done there with Luke would have been to give him the coda ending to the original trilogy that shows this is how the galaxy prospered. This is how peace is being restored. Now there's a new generation. There are conflicts that can be introduced because you have young people who are thinking about what their lives are going to be, what their philosophies are. They're going to be taught by Luke. There's always tensions with your teacher. There's, there's ways to create drama in that. And, and, and so Luke, Luke, because none of that happened, all of the original heroes are sort of sad sack failures, right? Because they achieved nothing. Right. But there's, there's another reason why you want to tell the story this way. And that's because you create a stable of characters that are each introduced and they're given little mini story arcs and you can branch off in lots of different directions with lots of different characters. Depending on that, that actually would be hard because then you wouldn't be able to carbon copy the, uh, a new hope and transfer it over to the force awakens. So that would have been, you're requiring them to actually write an original script by doing that. Well, maybe. I mean, there was expanded universe material there that they could have drawn from, like they're doing with Thrawn. There there are ways you could do Okay, now you're asking them to read books. Come on, Lord. I I know, but but, I mean, again, trying to give Disney the greatest benefit of the doubt that I can. I'm with you. I'm just ribbing you a little bit. Go ahead. We know the copying of A New Hope was a directive that came down from Iger, so they were saddled with that from the start. I think... The reason that you want that Jedi Academy, though, is because it gives you the chance to introduce these characters, build them up a little bit, and then move on. If something doesn't work with a brand new character, it's okay. You can swap swap the narrative to another one that maybe works a little bit better. You can actually pay attention to the audience feedback and react based on that uh, from a story writing uh, direction. Um, The other major mistake that they made, and this is the one that I just keep bashing my head against the wall about that I don't understand is they could not conceive of a Star Wars universe without the Empire. Now, the old EU (laughs) still had an Imperial remnant. There were still warlords that were out there, so you still had some Imperial imagery. But they just could not conceive of the idea that the Empire fell. And so they had to find this. Lauren, this this reminds me of, of people, you know, Everybody was on the uh, the side of hoping that this would be good when The Force Awakens came out. Remember, everybody was mostly positive. But one thing that people kept saying was like, where did the Force, where did the uh, uh, the First Order come from? What, what, who are these people? Like, they've got well, a, they've got a in, moon. In, in a weird way, <laughs> they're kind of, I, I think that's what they're trying to do with the Mandoverse now. I think that's why. Yeah, so showing... we got to go back and explain how in a 30 year span we went from, Hey, victory, we won. Do we all suck? Now, there's one other thing that I'm going to speculate about here a little bit, and I think this may be an explanation. I don't know. It may be that they were trying to be too faithful to George in a way. The way that they had described the Force being balanced was with the elimination of of the Sith. And I think 
the way things should have gone was not a recreation of the empire that they that they somehow just couldn't get away from i think they needed to have the sith order reborn but if you do that it undermines the force being balanced just like it does right now with anakin not having balanced it and it also um it kind of creates this situation where um you're you're rehashing a different thing i think you could do it in a different direction it could be something like more of a melding of the sith and and maybe uh uh uh, Dathomiri witch magic, which they've kind of played around with in some of the other stuff. Um, but I think that that the issue is that if you do revive the Sith Order directly, then you've essentially made the prophecy of the balancing of the Force, the ultimate balancing of the Force by Anakin, invalid. So I think that's kind of where the Knights of Ren came from. They were supposed to be a pseudo-Sith replacement that then There's, nobody there was did so much anything stuff. with. There was so much stuff introduced in The Force Awakens that was like, you know, by the time you get to the end of the trilogy, you said, well, we threw that away. That's a story yeah. for another day. That's a story for another day, right? The, uh, the, Captain the fatal, Phasma, I, I, you know, it's just so funny. The, the fatal flaws for me were the recreation of the Empire where that should have been the Sith and throwing away Luke almost entirely. Oh, just, not, well, yes. Had, had they not made those two mistakes, I think, honestly, they could have gone in a positive direction. Also, billions I, and billions of dollars uh, flushed, they, down, flushed down the drain with those I, decisions they made. I keep going back to, you also need a single visionary to be charting the course for these things. And they didn't have that. They didn't think they needed it. They went with, with uh, JJ and then Ryan and, and then back to JJ, and the total shifts were just... Uh, nothing could have survived. Well, you know, poor, poor Colin, he came in there and said, what do you want me to do with this? You know, like, no, you can't kill Luke. You know I, what? Like, though, I have uh, to have Luke somehow. The, the, the funny thing about Colin though, is that it's been kind of a modus operandi for, for Kathleen where she likes to get these hot directors who are making all this noise. And the second that they have a misstep somewhere elsewhere in their career, she cans them. Uh, oh, yeah. Colin was Colin was having some issues with that movie that came out at that time, and so there were rumors that he was going to get bounced even before he walked. But I give him total points for integrity for saying, "You know what? I can't do this. What you're right. asking me to do is impossible. This I, is I crap. Can't, I can't write this story this way." Uh, JJ, he'll yeah. do it. By golly, he'll do it because he had to yeah. prove that he could he could finish off that mystery box, which we found out he can't. The Duel of the Fates script was far better than what we, what we actually got. I still had some issues with it, but at least it was trying to do something. It was being creative, and I think that with another couple of polished drafts, it could have been a great movie. It's a shame they yep. it, it's a shame they didn't have the faith to pursue it. But now we're going to the Ray movie, and of all the things that Star Wars has announced, you know, Ahsoka is going to happen. The Acolyte, I mean, my gosh, the budget they've thrown at that thing. Uh, the legal documents that we have, we know it's it's basically happening. Um, but then the Ray movie is probably the the next most likely thing to come to fruition, simply because they put Daisy Ridley out there. We know that this came from an initiative uh, higher than than Lucasfilm, so it's got the backing of uh, the C suite at Disney. But what could they do? Let's let's give let's help them. Oh, they let, yes. they need some help, Lauren. What could they do with Ray that would make this less offensive to those of us who are like, you know, she wiped everything out from Darth Vader and from Luke. She is just, she is the answer to every problem of star Wars. And she has never had to overcome a thing except being found, but okay. What could they do to make this character more likable? So based on what they have already said, I I'm going to tell you right now, they can't. <laughs> But, and, and I'll give you reasons for that. Yeah, I know you're, um, you're being honest. They, they have already said that um, she's going to both restore the Jedi Order, but that the Jedi Order is in disarray. And so that's also self-contradictory. I don't know how you're going to manage to have a Jedi Order that's already in disarray, which means it exists. There are already students, but apparently there is dissension within the ranks. So well, if, you know what it is. Grogu keeps eating all of their little macaroons. That's the problem. If, if her goal then is to um, provide the backbone for that order and somehow uh, uh, 
heal whatever rifts are there. I don't know how you do that without being authoritarian. And even if she's not, They'll they've, never already let her be authoritarian. they've already stated that she's going to be going back to those books. So I guess, all right, I'll throw this just right off the cuff. This Maybe they do this. The uh, common knowledge says that the prequel Jedi had lost their way, and I tend to agree with that. They put themselves in an ivory tower. They had become uh, slavish to the Senate. They were acting in a political manner without uh, looking at the needs of the people. Their order was dwindling. It was dying. Um, I suppose you could say that Yoda said, ah, those books are boring. You don't need to read them anyway. Nobody read the books. Maybe that's why the Jedi failed. Maybe there's something in those <laughs> books that is really, really important. It's, it's like the old joke, you know, where, where the priest is reading his Bible one day and suddenly he breaks out in a cry of anguish and somebody says, father, what's wrong? And he says, it says, celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what they maybe that's well, what Lord, they missed Lord, here's, the what, here's what I want to see I want to see Ray open the books and all of the all of the force ghosts that still exist gather around as she tells them the tales of the sequel trilogy and then I want to watch their faces that, as they're like really? <laughs> really? there's like a thousand of these Palpatines out there? what? and how many ships showed up? what? <laughs> Luke did what? And the, the Luke Force goes like, I, I don't remember that, actually. <laughs> so you, you actually just gave me an idea. So, all right, I'm going to give you th three, three ways you, you could potentially make this work. Okay. If she is going to be creating this new Jedi Order and leading it into a new era of harmony, the only way I think you could get people a little bit on board with that is if she actually goes back and honors Luke. She has to make it apparent to oh, the people. No, no. Just, I know. Let's just stop, Lauren. Luke, they'll, I, I, they'll never already, do it. They hate that character's guts. I already said they wouldn't do it. But if, yep. you want, if you want to make it work, then I think the avenue is that you have, to, uh, you have to really focus in on the fact that all of the Jedi said that Darth Vader could not be redeemed. Obi-Wan thought that he was going to have to kill him. Yoda thought he was going to have to kill him. Luke was the only person that believed in his father and was willing to risk his life to prove that. He essentially, at that point, the battle was going to happen either way. Then he uh, became a then he became a nephew killer, though. Well, okay, yeah, but but I mean, let's 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 put that aside for a minute. We're fifteen <laughs> years on. Um, you you have to burnish that image of Luke. Personally, I don't think that that does enough to repair the damage, but if you want to try and repair the damage in some way, you have to focus on that. You actually have to try and fix some of what you did with Luke. This is, this is so painful to even figure out how they could possibly make it palatable. I think the better way to handle it is the one that I've been pushing before, and that is you have to have her make the heel turn. They're not going to do that because they're already 15 years ahead. If they were smart, they'd be doing this right after the Rise of Skywalker. Um, but what she should do is have Palpatine's threat actually be legitimate. Say that when he, she struck him down, he actually did inhabit her. And now she's having Ooh, to fend off. Diablo -esque. Of, I, I think that's the smart way to do this. What you have to do is humble Ray. She actually has to have a challenge nah, that nah, she cannot nah, face nah, alone. They're not going to do it. <laughs> Your third method is the one that you just gave me the idea for, which is that it's revealed at the end of this. You know, you have all of the droids. Uh, you have C-3PO and R2 who are supposed to be the recorders of this journey. They're the ones that are watching these events and recording them for, uh, uh, for the wills. Um, I expect R2-D2 to have his head removed and she's turned him into a toilet and she pees standing up. That's what I expect to happen in this movie. <laughs> well, what I'm telling you is that what you reveal is that R2's recorder has been damaged in some way and that the, these last stories have been completely mistranslated because he's huh. encountered some oh, damage. A... <laughs> I... <laughs> I, I Lord, gonna... all if over, you... the, we, we couldn't handle that level of joy all over North America. Cinemas would have audiences suddenly stand to their feet, screaming in joy and, and, and happiness that it had been saved. Well, what All would because be R2 couldn't, couldn't uh, he had a glitch in the system. What would be funny is you could actually do that at the end of this movie. Say R2 hasn't appeared at all. And then at the very end of the epilogue, you have R2 
projecting this story in front of the wills, which is supposedly the origin of all these stories to start with. And then C-3PO, who has not been present at all, breaks in and says, smacks him on the head and says, you're malfunctioning, you little twerp. That's not the way this went. Uh, <laughs> Luke would know, never and, do that. Right. You know, I, I, they, they would never what a do bunch it, of rubbish. But, but at least, you know, it, it gives you an out. Uh, it, that, that would give you an out, and that would be hilarious. Yeah. Oh, how I, how I would love to see something like that to be, you know, I, I'm up for being trolled that way, Lucasfilm, if you want to do it. But that would take new leadership. Lord, we've had a lot of fun. Um, we're At the time that we're recording this, the Mandalorian episode has not yet come out. However, uh, if all things work out well, you're going to give us the review right now. Good. So I have now watched episode seven of season three of The Mandalorian. And before I get into my review, I think I'd better start with some of the preconceptions that I had about what might have happened in this episode. Um, I had avoided any kind of spoilers prior to the episode's release. I had heard that there was footage that was released at Celebration this previous weekend. Uh, I didn't read anything about that. I was aware of rumors of... Uh, characters that may make an appearance in the show this season and certain events that may occur uh, without getting into details about those at the start of this review in case somebody wants to avoid spoilers i'm not going to mention them in this particular section um so i was going into this as fresh as possible because i wanted to be surprised and give you an unvarnished uh, reaction to uh, the episode uh, i should start by saying that this episode is called the spies um I don't really know why it's called The Spies. I didn't really see a whole lot of spying going on, but maybe that'll become more clear uh, in the next episode. I'm not sure. From here on, I am going to get into spoilers because it's kind of unavoidable right from the, the jump. Uh, I'm guessing most of you are probably already aware of how the episode opens, but just in case, I want to give that warning. So now is your time to click out if you want to avoid knowing anything. Okay. Uh, so the episode does begin with um, the Imperial agent who has been working within the New Republic making contact with Moff Gideon, explaining that things have gone awry on Navarro. And from there, we jump to Gideon uh, from wherever his secret base is, uh, joining a hollow conference with a number of what appear to be Imperial admirals, including uh, Captain Pelion. Uh, who is uh, Thrawn is referenced once again. Uh, you also have uh, uh, Brent, uh, Brendel Hux, uh, which is another direct tie to the sequel trilogy. There's all kinds of conversations about how they're planning to undermine the New Republic and, and how they're squabbling for resources amongst themselves. One of the things that was kind of bracing for me in this episode is that it feels like not only is um, Star Wars sort of uh, forgotten what it is, it's now starting to do so even within its own episode. Uh, one of the most striking lines that came from this meeting to me was uh, these captains and admirals saying that it's not going to be long before the citizens of the galaxy uh, have tired of the New Republic and all of its rules and regulations. And all I could think was, what was the empire? That that was exactly what they were about, was imposing order. And it's as though all of them have forgotten that. It was not like the, the empire was some happy-go-lucky place. Um, but the gist of all of this is to set the table to say, yes, we are going to the sequel trilogy. Thrawn is still in this universe, but so is the First Order. All of that is taking place behind the scenes. Um, Gideon is seeking from the Shadow Council to requisition... Uh, additional troops. Uh, he is requesting interceptors and bombers and also three Praetorian guards, which you may remember from The Last Jedi. Um, from there, we cut back to the, the situation with the Mandalorians and Mandalore itself. Um, the night owls and the, the mercenary fleet that uh, Bo-Katan had managed to take control of once more now that she's in possession of the Darksaber, are landing on Navarro and coming together with the Covert. There are tensions between the two groups because, of course, there are. But they make camp together and they make their preparations to go and retake Mandalore. 
and their plan is to uh, leave the fleet in orbit and to send scouting expeditions down to the surface to make sure that it is safe to proceed while they look for the Great Forge. Um, there's uh, tensions between the two groups. This is a recurring theme throughout the episode. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the most jarring things that does occur in this episode is that there's a point at which uh, Bo-Katan is saying that she doesn't know if she can keep these groups together, that they've been at odds for so long. And Din Djarin has a, a nice scene with her, or at least it begins that way, where he is... Um, saying that to him what matters, he says that the children of the Watch, they didn't really know anything about the Darksaber. It's not important to them. What's important to them is honor and camaraderie and, and all of the tenets of the creed. And then he bends the knee to her and says, this is why he'll follow her to the end of the earth and, and so on. And it's at this point that I literally said out loud uh, a famous line of uh, uh, the critical drinkers. I don't know if I can say it here without <laughs> affecting the ranking of the video, so I won't repeat it. But um, this is the final emasculation of Din Djarin uh, in this episode, I believe. Um, there, uh, These groups of Mandalorians, as they're striking out to find the Great Forge, they do encounter... Uh, what appears to be, I would call it, a glass-skimming sailing ship that contains Mandalorian survivors who have remained on the planet this entire time. Uh, it does provide a chance for some exposition later where uh, Bo-Katan explains that she actually did surrender to the Empire. She surrendered the Darksaber to Moff Gideon. She was stabbed in the back. The Night of a Thousand Tears occurred. Uh, it sort of, I, I believe, validates my theory on what happened with the Children of the Watch and why they continued to helmets. They didn't explicitly state it, but I think that it's inferred. Um, they make their way into the forge, and um, this is another place where I feel like they kind of forget what they've set up within their own episode. Uh, as they approach the forge, there's an ambush, and uh, there are Imperial troops there that are wearing Mandalorian-styled armor, that is painted white, so it looks sort of like uh, stormtroopers with Mandalorian helmets in a way, and it's explicitly called out that they're wearing Beskar. Um, but they don't seem to be wearing Beskar because they go down to blaster fire just as easily as normal stormtroopers would. Um, Din Djarin's armor clearly has not had that issue in earlier seasons. Now you could say it's because he's layered in very thick Beskar, I guess, which is true, but it didn't seem to confer any advantage upon them. Gideon himself does arrive in his Mandalorian-styled armor. There's the traditional monologuing that you would expect, but it's now taken on a Saturday morning cartoon quality. Uh, I didn't get that this is the normal Moff Gideon speech. To me, it felt stilted and predictable, and I didn't, I didn't feel his intellect in this. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting is they're continuing to sort of uh, frame him as the canon version of Rom Mach from Dark Forces. Uh, he has said that his armor that he is now wearing is an evolution of the Dark Trooper program, and it is now a suit that is made of Beskar, and that uh, the advantage that it confers upon him is that now uh, there is a human intelligence inside the suit, and that was exactly how Dark Forces took place. However, at the climax of this episode, and this is the big spoiler for the episode, Din Djarin is captured, and captured rather easily uh, as well. Paz Vizsla tries to guard the other Mandalorian's retreats and, of course, uh, is killed. All of this smacks to me of a handoff that's about to occur. Uh, I've been feeling for the last two or three episodes that I'm not certain that Din Djarin is actually going to survive this season. Uh, it may be that he does. They may pull off the incredible rescue and have him continue to lead the show, but I'm getting the sense that that's not going to happen. They seem to have been prepping for a handoff. Bo-Katan has been the absolute focus of this show. Uh, you had Rick Famuyiwa uh, during Celebration who came out and said that we're no longer considering the title of the Mandalorian to refer specifically to Din, but that it could refer to the Mandalorian culture as a whole. Uh, as a whole. And it, it seems to me that they're, uh, 
they're prepping the ground to make that change. I've been thinking a lot about what's happened in season three. And the more I thought about it, it feels to me like they're the removal of Gina Carano was a much bigger deal than I think even we realized. It caused fan backlash, but more than that, it required the pause in the production of the show that took two years before we got new episodes airing. And during that time, no actor can really sit idle. They want to work. And I think that's what happened with The Last of Us. Um, he needed to keep working. That did cause some conflict behind the scenes because it created scheduling issues. Uh, I don't think that Pedro Pascal has really appeared in the armor at all this season. I've been looking at the credits, and I don't think I've ever seen him actually credited in the, in the order of appearances. It seems to me that he's only doing ADR looping and that Brandon Wayne and Latif Crowder are the ones who are filling out the suit. Now, there have been rumors over the last few years that... Pedro had some issues even before on the show because he was required to wear the helmet all the time. I don't know if I put all that much stock in those rumors, but I do understand that actors do want to have their faces shown. Pedro, his star is rising. He is showing up in lots of big uh, TV shows. Uh, he's been appearing in movies. That's going to be a more lucrative gig for him, and I think that's why... He didn't just clear the decks for The Mandalorian. He went off and he did The Last of Us. And I suspect that probably caused some more tension behind the scenes than maybe we thought. As well, this entire season feels to me as though each episode has been a contrivance of one kind or another to get to a predetermined endpoint without really putting in any thought into whether the events that are unfolding to get there are logical or at least don't feel forced. This smacks to me of a handoff in leadership. Even though Favreau is credited with writing and he is the creator of the show, I really am starting to believe that Dave Filoni is now calling the shots. His elevation within the company uh, does make him John's superior, and I'm thinking that the word has come down that you are going to implement these things to facilitate these connections to the sequel trilogy and the handoff to whoever the Mandalorian will eventually become. My guess is that it will leading going forward. Totally could be wrong. I, I, I hope that I am, but even if I am, I think at this point, for me, the canon of The Mandalorian ends at season two. I, I don't think that you can continue in this vein and have it work, um, which seems to be the story of Star Wars as a whole. I wish I had better news for you, but that's my thoughts on episode seven of The Mandalorian. Uh, I am going to be on vacation for the next week, so I will not have a timely review in time for the season finale. I apologize for that. There was nothing really I could do about the timing of this trip. But I promise when I get back that I will watch it and I'll post something up, and I look forward to your comments then. In the meantime, we'll see you in about a week and a half. Take care. Well, Lauren, it's been fantastic having you on. People love when you're on the channel. And uh, I personally love to have these conversations with you. You have a vast knowledge of Star Wars, but also you have a fantastic wit. And I just think that uh, the dynamic's great. Thank you for being on. Where can people find you out in this great big galaxy of the internet? Well, I write articles on the site at uh, thatparkplace.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Lauren Connor and on YouTube at Lauren Connor 9030. Fantastic. Well, folks, if you like content like this, you might consider clicking the like button, share, subscribe, and you can stick it to the algorithms. When you click it, we're talking about that notification bell. The Pro Show is today, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. You are going to want to be there and be live. We will be breaking down the actual strategy with the name of that strategy that Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm have been using to uh, convince Disney to go along with all of their shenanigans we're going to break it. We're going to put it out there. Part one on the live show today. And then we will do part two of that on Renegade Online this Sunday, 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Sunday again. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun.